Carlos, thank you very much. Eric, thank you very much for the invitation. And, and thank you, everybody, for joining us in this talk. And let me just first start saying that the, this project that I will talk about, uh, I must say, it was ignited by, by some work of Carlos and Eric uh, in, 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 in different times, different countries. Um, and uh, luckily, Carlos and Eric uh, got together and talked about what they were doing. And then I jumped in uh, late on, and uh, and it had been it had been a nice somehow uh, joint work. Um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to move it forward because of different complications. Eric moved, and I had surgery, and then, but I, we hope that we will somehow relocate and and, and talk about it. So the idea is um, to talk about a very old subject. Oh, sorry if I say that, Professor Lambert, but uh, it's, a, it's a very old object that, uh, that I liked a lot. It's called equivariant unitary bordism of surfaces, and more in general, equivariant unitary bordism. So I will do my best to explain what is all this about, um, and I hope everybody that is joining get an idea of what is this uh, bordism theory. Um, my aim is to explain some uh, recent construction that were done by Carlos, uh, and one very nice construction that Eric carried out uh, from low dimension topology that we were able to use to, to see some new structure that we weren't aware of in the equivalent unitary Bordism group. And so I will talk about all these issues on the talk. But let me, well, I will assume that some of these things are somewhat known, um, but simply cope with me and, and then you will see that when we get to surfaces, it's, it's not uh, as complicated. So we will be dealing with uh, manifolds that we will call unitary. And by this, we mean that um, stably, uh, the tangent bundle can be complexified. So this, this, this uh, reasons to understand this is, is we want to somehow understand a homology theory on these manifolds. And if they are just complex, then it will be only even dimensional manifolds. And we want to have something that is on all dimensions. And so we stabilize this condition. Uh, and we call that a manifold is unitary whenever you can add some copies of the reals. And at some point, you may complexify this bundle. Uh, this is the category of manifolds I'm going to use. And uh, we will say that two of these manifolds are unitarily cobordant if you can find a bordism that is unitary in this sense, on which the boundaries are M1 minus M2, M2 is thought of uh, as you take the opposite complex structure on the other side, it's coming and going, no? So this is just the usual bordism structure, you're always putting some decorations, we put in the unitary decoration. Um, some picture, no? Of course, I didn't say anything where these manifolds live, but they could live in an underlying space X. And I can do all these bordisms in X, or I could just do them over a point, and then it's just the manifold themselves. Um, the idea is that we can bundle up all this uh, structure in a very nice algebraic uh, gadget. Uh, and so we could take the equivalence classes of those manifolds that are compact and closed of dimension N, uh, and the the, the, the decoration here means that it's unitary. And the extra decoration is that we put an action of a group from an, an extra group. We may act on the manifold and at the same time that is acting on the tangent bundle and at the same time it's, it's acting complex wise in the stably complexification. Uh, if we take all those manifolds and we take the unitary relation, we get a set. So this is the set of Bordism classes of manifolds with all these decorations, a G action and a stably complex structure on the tangent one. Uh, and then we can make them into a group by taking the disjoint union of manifolds. And then we just bundle all them up by taking all dimensions and we take uh, this graded group. This is the graded Bordism group of uh, unitary equivariant manifolds where our group is going to be um, compactly grouped. But, but for our studies, it's, it's going to be finite, but it could be any, any compactly group. It could be any group, but, but of course, if we want to say things better, that is compact. Um, 
this graded group um, has a lot of structure. It's moreover a ring because we could do the product of manifolds. We simply just take the product of two manifolds. And of course, the grading is preserved. It's the sum of the gradings. Uh, but what is more important that we will use in what comes is that is that the equivariant Bordism group is a module over the non-equivariant one. Because Pardon the non-equivariant, yes. There is a question in the chat. Uh, that oh, is, how do I know is, that? Wait. Is, uh, is R going to have trivial action on the stabilizing mm -hmm. bundle? Yeah, but... uh, no. Well, yes. Uh, because uh, the action here, the group is acting on the manifold and on the tangent bundle uh, by the associated action. And here is trivial action. So it's, it's going to be trivial, this real part. It's, it's just a stabilization with trivial representations. So you're right, good question. I'm not stabilizing with any different type of representation. It's the trivial one. And uh, once it's complexified, then it stays again the trivial action of the group. So, so yes, sorry for not explaining that. So we're stabilizing with trivial representations. Um, uh, so let, let me see where we where I was. So this uh, Bordism group, as it's defined, it's, um, it's, it's abstractly, uh, it's an algebraic gadget that is abstractly defined. No? We take all manifolds, whatever they are, and uh, then we mod out by an equivalence relation. And as it is, um, it's a difficult subject to understand. But um, from uh, a beautiful idea that I suppose come from uh, Pontryagin himself and René Tom, both. I don't know which one was the first, I suppose both, or at the same time, or I don't know. And they noticed that uh, there was a way to reobtain this, uh, this group of uh, Bordism classes of manifolds as the homotopy groups of some um, limit of spaces. And these limit of spaces, uh, which are now called the uh, Tom spectra, and they're very nice and easy to define using the classifying spaces of the unitary group or of the group that we're thinking of for the, for the structure on the, on, the, on, the, on the vector bond. So what one does is one takes the um, classifying space of unitary actions, one takes the uh, complex vector bundle associated to this uh, universal space. And one does the one point compactification, or if we want, we take the vectors of, of uh, dimension less than one and we collapse uh, all the sphere bundle. And we construct a space that is called the Tom space of the vector bundle, which is called MUK. And these MUKs somehow map good to each other when the K is uh, changed. And the very nice theorem of uh, René Tom is that, uh, well, a generalization, because he did it for the, for the orthogonal, orthogonal group, is that the stable homotopy groups of these spaces precisely are the groups, the Bordism groups of the associated, associated group. So this gave away, well, this gave a, gave a way to calculate these Bordism groups, uh, because uh, prior to this construction, the the way to find the Bordism classes was uh, using using uh, low dimensional topology, surgery, or specific uh, construction on Pontryagin classes or chain class. But with these homotopy groups, then uh, many more structures could be used to calculate the the Bordism groups. And um, now, why this um, the Bordism of unitary manifolds is pretty nice because it's universal in some, in some way. And, and because the Bordism ring, as it is, is a very nice polynomial algebra with generators on even dimensional uh, manifolds. So for every even dimension, there is a generator uh, as, a, as, a, as an algebra. And uh, whenever we tensor with the rationals, one could take the projective spaces as generators, but there is a very nice construction. Uh, one can look at Milner's or Novikov's construction to see explicitly which are the manifolds which generate the unitary Bordism group calculation on Chern classes. Um, and then, um, since this is a very nice algebra, one would like to understand uh, the structure of the equivariant Bordism group as a module, as a module of this very nice algebra. Um, this uh, structure was somehow constructed firstly, and Professor Lambert might correct me, 
by Corner and Floyd, Stong, uh, Michael Atillo also. Uh, they were the ones uh, somehow developing this um, equivalent structure on bordism. Mm. Now, I just mentioned that there is a homotopical version for the non-equivariant bordism group. Uh, and there is a homotopical version for the equivariant one. Uh, the construction is basically the same. Um, and as uh, Graham Siegel once said in a talk, that his job as a student of Atija just consisted in putting a G wherever Atija made some contribution. So he just put a G whenever, of course, it's fault, but this is what he said. So one just puts a G all over the place, which simply means that we take the universal uh, principal uh, complex bundle of rank K whenever all the possible G actions are taken into account. So this is the universal G principle. So this is the unit, the U principal bundle with G action, which is basically taking a, a complete G universe and take the Grassmannian and, and, and it boils down to, to this space. And one can carry out the same construction, Tom's construction, you just simply do it and uh, collapse the sphere bundle. And you have some sort of spaces that are equivariant. And one can define now the homotopy equivariant bordism groups as these um, um, the stable homotopy groups. So we take representations, complex representations, and we simply stabilize with the representations. And this will be our definition of the homotopy equivariant bordism groups that are unitary. And because it's done with a, with a G spectrum, many properties follow. Um, and this is what I will discuss in a while. So whatever we- What is SW? What is SW? Let me go back. Is this, is this sphere. So where is do it? One point do you yeah, do you one point compactification okay. of the representation. So it has two fixed points, the zero and the infinity, or, or yeah, the tom construction of the bundle of our point of the sphere. Yeah. Cool. So we have to stabilize, that. that's a good point. We have to stabilize over all representations. This is what makes it this, in my point of view, difficult because we need to put all possible representations on the stabilization. And, and, and these, these stabilizations yeah. might kill things. And Good. The superscript G, mean, does that mean equivariant or fixed point set? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> the fixed point set on the space of maps are the equivariant maps. So somehow okay. just, okay. just to both. So the, the fixed point set on the set of maps is the equivariant maps. Because we the, the action goes on the left and on the right. So yes, so, so fixed points means equivariant maps from left to right. And good, so these are these homotopy bordism groups, um, equivariant. And uh, of course, most of the construction that are done without the equivariant action can be generalized. So there is the Tom Pontragin map, which is precisely the one that permits to show that the if we get rid of the G, it shows that the geometrical bordism groups, unitary, are isomorphic to the homotopic ones. If we, if we get rid of the G. If we put a G, uh, it turns out that this, this result is, is, not, is not true. Namely, that uh, the, 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 the geometrical uh, bordism classes are all only positive degrees because we only have uh, positive degree manifolds. So they are. Meanwhile, the homotopical ones have things in negative degrees. Uh, just this fact shows that they are different. They're going to be different. And, and, and one big question is to understand explicitly the difference of these two uh, equivalent bordism. This is the stabilized one, this is the non-stabilized one. So without G, it's an isomorphism, say, of uh, spectrum or the homology theories are the same, but with the G, they are different. Uh, one way to realize this is using the, the somehow Euler classes of the representations. And if the uh, somehow uh, the representation is, is non-trivial, then we get some classes of negative degrees. This is just simply by, by looking at the definition that we just, we just had. So it has uh, extra classes in negative degrees, some sort of classes that invert some sort of structures, which the geometrical one doesn't have. And so why am I saying this? Because it's not strictly easy to get the geometrical one out of the homotopical one, because we don't know exactly what is the relation. Without the G, they're going to be isomorphic. And so 
this uh, Buddhism group has been studied, uh, and I'm happy to say that Professor Landweber here present uh, was one of the ones uh, calculating and doing beautiful construction on how to understand these uh, equivalent Buddhism groups in the unitary or the oriented case. And, and Professor Landweber did it, um, studied uh, the case of cyclic groups. Um, and in, in these cases, it turns out that the equivariant Buddhism groups turns out to be a free module over this algebra, over this polynomial algebra on, on uh, generators of even dimension. And I must say, the, 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 the constructions or the, the way this is proven, it relies on knowing explicitly uh, the homology of the classifying spaces of the groups. It, it, it turns out a, a very explicit knowledge of the homology of the classifying spaces of the groups, uh, or the better, the Bordism groups of the classifying spaces. And, and so these constructions were generalized for finite abelian P groups, for any abelian finite group, for compact abelian groups, and for metacyclic groups. So for all these classes of groups, the equivariant Bordism group is a free module on even dimensional generators uh, um, over the Bordism ring. Um, and so this has many things uh, inside it. For example, uh, every odd dimensional unitary manifold with a G action bounds whenever you have all these groups and, the, and bounds uh, with a G equivalent manifold. So that, that, that particularly implies um, good. So uh, at the time, because of these uh, examples and from, of course, crossing the fingers that things will be nice, uh, getting the ideas from representation theory that if we know the information on cyclic subgroups then we know somehow the information of the representations, then one might expect that, the, that this holds for all groups, namely that the Bordism unitary equivalent group will be a free module over the uh, Bordism ring in even dimensional generators. Uh, and this was stated uh, in several uh, papers. Um, um, and this is what somehow led me to understand uh, what's, what could I do uh, with what I was working with in K-theory in the last years. Uh, if this conjecture is true, which now we know is false, but if it were, if it's true, well, if you fix a group, it, it might be true for a specific group. Then, in particular, the, the tampon dragging map is injected, namely, namely the geometrical ones inject into the homotopical ones. And so, this was uh, written uh, in the 1980s. Um, uh, this question, because if the specific calculations were done for every somehow for every abelian group in 1980 by Rowlett. It was somehow restated uh, by Comesaña on in, in, in this uh, big book on equivalent homotopy theory uh, of that was edited by Peter May, the Alaska book, I think it's called Jose Cantarero might correct me. It's, I don't recall how it's called. It's the Alaska Proceedings, if I recall how it's called this book. Um, on which many results on equivalent homotopy theory were written. And then Greenlees and May 97. Um, it somehow gave it a different uh, twist, uh, which they say recall an old and probably false conjecture that the Bordism, the unitary Bordism group, is a free module on even dimensional generators. Um, and our results somehow show that exactly it is false, the conjecture. Uh, we shared these results with Professor Landweber, and uh, he very nicely said. Congratulations on bringing a new life to an old problem, which I'm very happy that we're doing. And somehow, by, by, by the connoisseurs, and I was not the one of the connoisseurs, the, the conjecture was expected to be false. And I, I asked Greenlees uh, some years ago, and he told me, yeah, there's no reason to expect that this is true, and from what I believe, it's going to be false. And, but at the time, I didn't really understand what he meant and why. Anyway. So what is, what is important when one does calculation on boredism that is equivariant? Well, as, as anything with uh, 
some sort with calculations and equivalent homotopy or if one wants to control the isotropy groups. If one can control the isotropy groups, as Professor Edmonds was talking about last uh, two weeks ago, uh, Professor Edmonds was controlling the, the isotropy groups in the sense that it's either uh, the whole group fixes the point or nobody. So namely, you, you're, you're choosing some sort of actions on which you either have a, a point on which the isotropy is the whole group or, or, or the identity only. And this is controlled by choosing a family of subgroups on which you can um, select what type of manifolds or, or spaces you choose, depending on which isotropies you allow to have. So you choose a family, which is closed under conjugation and under subgroups. Oops, uh, this is a family of subgroups of a group. And you say that a manifold is F3, namely, uh, it, 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 which simply means that uh, all the possible isotropies are contained in this family. So you control the isotropies of the family. And, uh, and if we restrict only of manifolds of certain isotropy type, we might take a new, somehow a new family or a new Bordism group. Namely, we just, we restrict here manifold with a specific isotropy. Uh, if we take the family of all subgroups, well, we just have what you, we just defined, namely the, the equivalent Bordism group. Um, and of course, we could do this uh, for manifolds with boundary. And this is um, the next somehow tool that one uses. Um, one wants manifolds uh, whose isotropies in the interior are controlled by a bigger family, but the boundary may only have only a restricted type of boundary. So we controlled the, the, the isotropy groups of the boundary with a smaller family. And the idea, is to understand these relative Bordism groups. If one understands all relative Bordism groups and of course all the boundaries by a spectral sequence argument, one controls everything. But, but it's sometimes not so easy to understand what are these relative Bordism groups. Uh, the point is, of course, there is a very nice long exact sequence. If we have a, a smaller family of any manifold, of course, with a smaller family of isotropy groups is uh, a manifold with bigger isotropy groups or more isotropy groups, and one can have this relative term which, whose boundary uh, lowers down the dimension of the manifold. And this is, of course, the main tool that one uses. Uh, I would like to emphasize that if I take the family with only the identity group, namely it says the only isotropy group that we allow is the identity, that means the manifold has a free action. And if the manifold has a free action, then we can somehow lower the G to to the space and we recover is the unitary Bordism of the classifying space. And that's what I said before, one needs to have a good control of these Bordism groups to understand how to build them up to, to somehow let all the actions uh, roam around. What brought me to this subject was um, somehow a, a statement on vector bundles. It was a statement of vector bundles. The statement of vector bundles was, how do I understand the vector bundles uh, over a space on which uh, the space has a, mani uh, has a boundary and it has a vector bundle over it. And I want to understand somehow which, wh what is the classifying space of such vector bundles over manifolds with boundary. And uh, doesn't matter all these letters because it's not, it's not so relevant, all these letters. What I want to point out is whenever we have a family that is adjacent, namely the only difference between the, the groups on the boundary and in the interior is just one, one isomorphism uh, conjugacy class of subgroups, namely A. Then one can take such manifold and localize the information on the fixed point data, namely take the fixed points uh, over the whole of the group A of the manifold, and then you take the normal bundle around it. And uh, if, you, if you do this, the Bordism class of the original manifold will be the same as the Bordism class of the normal bundle uh, around the fixed point of the group A. And the normal bundle then can be classified by some classifying spaces. The classifying spaces will be somehow labeled depending on the representation around uh, the fixed point data. And and, and what it's written here is if you, if you have, if you know the representation on the normal part, uh, you, you, you somehow keep the representation with this, which is this row. And then, of course, for each reducible representation, you have a dimension 
uh, if you have n of these irreducible representations, the, the, this is your dimensions of the unitary space. The Q is somehow the quotient of the group by the normal subgroup. And this twiddle here, which is a, which is a twisting, which simply say that the action of this, um, of this quotient group is projective. It's, it's not a bona fide action. It has some error in the projectivization. And the projectivization is measured by a cocycle. And this cocycle is telling you, look, these are actions of the group on the on the bottom, but as but are projected, projective, sorry, and this projectiveness is measured by a central extension or by a cocycle, either way. But these are some sort of classifying spaces that are easily constructed using Grassmannians. But the point is that these unitary groups of these ideas in families could be treated as a standard. Um, uh, bordism groups of classifying spaces. But the classifying spaces are, again, classifying spaces of finite groups, classify, and these twisted versions of the Grassmannians. And these, to, to understand these twi twisted versions of the Grassmannians is something that I still haven't had a hold of it because the bordism of that, I don't know exactly how they are. Good. So this I did it in K-theory, and it was a question of Ulrike Tillman. What can you say? That you what about what you did in in in, in vector bundles? What can you say in bordism? And this is this is somehow what brought us to bordism. And but let me just give you an example, picture example that I did by hand. This here the group is the symmetric group on three letters. Here we have a surface with boundary. Uh, the action is just the dihedral action, if you want to say, it's just rotation and then also flipping. And uh, what I'm doing here is I'm taking uh, a specific uh, families, the difference of the two families is given by the conjugacy class of the group B. I see the fixed points of the group B, and this is just, here is a rotation, so it's just one fixed point. So um, when I see the bordism group of surfaces with these two relative groups, what I notice is that I can localize on the fixed point set of the action, which is in this case is just one point, but then I see the normal bundle, and the normal bundle is just uh, the action of Z2 in this normal model, the non-trivial action of rotation. And uh, this, then I use one copy of the classifying space of line bundles. And uh, it turns out that what I have at the end is just a map from the fixed point set, which is just a point in this case, to the classifying space of BU1, which is just recovering the representation that I have around the point. So this Bordism group of the symmetric group with respect to these two relative families is simply giving me an element of the zero bordism group of BU1, which is just a copy of the integers. So, so somehow what I just said, all these things that I just said before, allows me to focus my attention on bordism group of classifying space. Bernardo, there is a question in the, oh, in the chat. Sorry, yeah. sorry, About sorry. the last slide. Are yes. irreducible representations invariant under conjugation? Uh, the irreducible representations are indeed, uh, oh, well, no, uh, that's the point uh, here that I want to show you. Let me go back. How do I go back? Uh, no, uh, uh, here. So this question relates to precisely what I suppose, Professor Doberman. If you take, um, you, you, you need to take the orbit uh, as of the, of the G action, of course, on the representation of A. And you take this Q, of course, uh, you, you may see, you may take a subgroup of this Q, which I call it Q sub rho, which are the elements of the group Q, which leave the representation rho fixed. So you need to take the isotropy subgroup, the isotropy of the action of Q on the representations of A. So the, to answer your question is yes, but I take this subgroup. Uh, because, of course, the rest is just an orbit. Uh, I, I hope I, I, I answered your question. So the, the representation is an A representation. And of course, Q is acting on the irreducible representation. And I take the orbits of the action and I take a representative of that. I take the subgroup of Q, which fixes this uh, irreducible representation. And that's my Q here. And so I hope I answered the question. So let me just give some examples of this uh, type of construction that is uh, somehow by Professor Landberg was very heavily used. So if I have a, an abelian group 
and a pair of families that differ by just a subgroup. If I want to know what is the relative Buddhism groups, it's just, well, just is just a quoting or just, but it's just uh, the Buddhism group of the classifying space of these abelian quotients times several copies of uh, Grassmannians. Um, so in some sense, if I, since I know the Buddhism group of Grassmannians, which is very nice and it's free, well, I need to know only the Buddhism groups of these uh, classifying spaces, which is not as easy, but uh, a lot of information is known. So this way I manage to understand what is the Buddhism group of the relative family. And in some sense, one can have a good hold of it because all these pieces are uh, manageable. Um, now, uh, there is also a case that was heavily used by um, Tom Dick and several others, which is I'm going to localize my manifolds on the relative family, which is all possible actions in the interior. And in the boundary, I'm going to subtract only the whole group. So think of it as the following way. I want to see the relative Buddhism groups on which any action is allowed on the interior, but on the boundary, you cannot have fixed points of the whole group. If you do this, then any manifold, you just simply take the fixed points of the whole group and the normal bundle, bundle around it, and there is no more information. So then in this case, it's pretty simple, just a sum of Grassmannians, and we just take the Buddhism groups of Grassmannians. So in this case, it's somewhat simple in some sense. Uh, and this is pretty useful for localization purposes. Let me show you the case of a group without subgroups, without non-trivial subgroups. So Z mod P, P prime. So we just take here, how many families do we have? Well, we have the family of all subgroups and we have the family of the trivial subgroup. There's only two families, nothing else. In this case, one can carry out everything. So we have the long exact sequence associated. So here we have a, Free actions, because this is, this is the group with just uh, the identity. Then we have all possible actions. And then we have the relative actions. And we have the long exact sequence. This long exact sequence, by we just, what we just said, the relative term becomes Buddhism of Grassmannians. So pretty nice object. It's just the normal bundles. And since the Grassmannians and the Buddhism of Grassmannian is only in even dimensions, then this part has no odd part. Then we have a five term exact sequence. And to understand the Buddhism groups that are equivariant, one needs to understand this boundary map. And the question is here, can you, so if you have a manifold with a free action, this is what is here, take an odd dimensional manifold with a free action of the group ZP that is unitary. Well, the lens spaces are like that. Can you build a manifold of dimension one higher with any action, of course, such that the boundary of that manifold uh, is exactly what you had here. So this is just the boundary map. And, uh, and this is the main question. If you have a free action, does it bound equivalently? Well, in the case of cyclic groups, by construction, one can simply construct these manifolds. And it's, it's not a trivial fact, but it's a nice fact to show that precisely these, uh, these lens spaces bound. And the construction is given simply by some very nice construction from algebraic geometry, if you want. And that means explicitly that the Bordism group is only located in even dimensions, the equivalent one. And moreover, since it's a subgroup of this one, it's free. So in this case, by geometrical construction of the explicit generators of the free actions of the cyclic group, one can exactly know what is the Bordism group for cyclic actions. Uh, of course, the idea is one to get this and to generalize it, but as you might imagine, it's not that easy. And whenever the group is uh, a billion compact Lie group, so copies of the circles, um, then uh, it was already shown by Tom Dick that the localization map in fixed points is injective. Uh, so this is pretty nice because if I have uh, an action of circles, then I can just simply may look at what happens at the fixed point data and the normal bundles, and I know exactly what is the Buddhism class. So you might imagine that you can just recognize the Buddhism class out of the fixed point data manifolds and the churn classes around it. 
Um, and therefore, going from the geometrical one to the homotopical one in the abelian compact case uh, is an injective map. Okay, so the abelian case somehow is pretty nicely behaved. So how do how does one somehow um, confront or attack this type of problems in the equivalent setup? And this is why this is this is well known. You just go look at fixed point data. Go go look at fixed point data and see what happens in the fixed point data. And if you can recover the whole uh, construction or the whole manifold out of fixed point data, then you're done. The idea, of course, comes from representation theory. Now, if you if you know your uh, representation and you know how it behaves, the, the how every subgroup acts on the representation, you may reconstruct the representation. And so the idea is you have a manifold with a G action, you can restrict it to a subgroup and then take the, 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 the relative term uh, that it has. So what, what I mean is take a manifold with a G action, take a subgroup, the subgroup is now K, and now take the fixed points of K and the normal bundle information around the point the points fixed by K. And this gives you a very nice homomorphism that if we put all families of subgroups, gives us the fixed point data information of the manifold. And in good cases, one expects this map to be injective. Why? Because the right-hand side is precisely bordism groups of Grassmannians with some, some, some invariant part, but it's just Grassmannians. So if one is lucky, one gets all the information from the fixed point data. And the nice thing about these Mackey functors in general is that if we do tensor it with the rationals, then it becomes an isomorphism. So rationally, the Bordism group is simply what happens at the fixed point data. So rationally, we could simply, one could think, forget about the complicated Bordism group and look at the fixed point data and the Grassmannians around it and the representations. So the question then, then is not so much about the uh, free part, but the torsion part. So what is the torsion? And um, of course, if the group is, um, is a billion, then we know that there is no torsion. But the, po the important point here is that if, if, if this were to be um, injective or the evenness conjecture will, will imply that this map is injective. So if, if, if we believe in the evenness conjecture, then uh, fixed point data recovers all the information. Um, and the reason is, one reason is, is, is the following. Uh, if, we, if we take any free action, which is what motivated uh, our work with Eric and Carlos and Andres, if you take a free action um, and, 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 and see it as a manifold with a G action, but embed it in the Bordism group equivariantly, namely forget that you need to have only free actions and see what happens, Namely, you have a manifold here, which has a free action. It doesn't bound in, in free actions, but maybe it bounds in non-free actions. The point is that all these elements in the Bordism group of uh, the classifying space of a finite group are torsion. All the, well, not all, but the interesting ones are torsion. And of course, if the conjecture is true, there is no torsion in the equivalent Bordism group. So they must vanish. So it automatically implies any free manifold and any action with a free, any manifold with a free action should bound equivalently. So the evenness conjecture has this corollary. And that was somehow the original idea that, that, that Carlos pursued to, to show that this conjecture might be false. Let's try to construct a manifold with a free action that is unitary, which doesn't bound equivalently. And so the, the conjecture is true by the groups I said before, Landweber, Stone, Osa, Leffler, Comisania, Many others, but uh, as I said recently, recently is two years ago, but I'm old, so since I'm old, recently is many years ago. Um, uh, Carlos, who is organizing this seminar with Eric, um, decided to, to somehow tackle uh, the problem, not in this complete generality that I'm saying it, but more in a like a classical way. As, as, as say, I don't know, Pontriagin or Rochlin would do well, which is let's try to see if surfaces, if any surface with a free action bounds. Now, now, now the question, it's simpler in some sense. No? And, 
and, and Carlos with a student of his, which if I recall well, uh, he, had, he has some, Carlos has some very nice procedure combinatorically using diagrams that I'm not very good at it, but Carlos is very good. He proved that if the group is a billion symmetric, um, symmetric mean uh, symmetric groups, or dihedral symmetric or alternating groups. So he added uh, the alternating and the symmetric groups to the list of groups on which any surface with a free action bounds. So, um, but somehow at this point, Carlos was showing that for all these groups, there is no contradiction with the conjecture, namely, any manifold, any surface, compact, oriented, with an action that is free from any symmetric group, uh, it bounds equivalently. Uh, but at, at the same time, Eric, who is to left, oh no, he's there still. <laughs> well, this is the story of Eric told by me, no? Uh, he was doing other things, <laughs> uh, similar, of course, uh, and he had uh, noticed that um, that there is an obstruction for uh, a manifold with a, a surface with a free action to be to bound equivalently, uh, because he was studying covers and surfaces with a G action, um, and so he he had this result in a paper of his embedded embedded there. Uh, somehow you don't know about it, then you don't see it, but he was embedded there. But luckily, Eric uh, noticed the result of Carlos, and they talked together. And, and Eric somehow got this result out of his uh, very nice paper, and uh, and this is the result that we've been exploiting, exploiting, which is that uh, Eric had a, a very nice way, constructive way to show when a surface with a free action uh, bounds. And so this is what I'm going to talk about now. So the idea, which which, which somehow is the following result, which of course I'm I'm, I'm using the generalized version. But, uh, but it's Eric, the first one, and not only the first one, he has the idea, uh, is the following. So all these letters amount to the following. Take a manifold surface with a free action. The group is finite. You name it. Question. Is this uh, manifold the boundary of a three-dimensional manifold, but on which the action of the group is of any kind in the interior? It doesn't have to be free. Of course, if it's free, then this is calculated by the Bordism group of the classifying space. But no, let's suppose it's not free, so you allow any action on the interior. And, and this, this uh, amounts to the following map in, uh, in, in Bordism groups. Take a three-dimensional manifold with boundary. In the interior, you allow any action, but on the boundary has to be free. Okay, you have all the, the Bordism group of those manifolds. Take the boundary, the boundary is free. And therefore, you have a surface with a free action, which goes to the second Bordism group of the classifying space of BG, but oriented. I'm talk I've been talking about unitary, but it's very similar. And the question is, what is the co-kernel? No, that, that's the question. What is the co-kernel? Which are the manifolds on which you, you cannot extend it equivalently? So what Eric uh, very nicely noticed uh, was uh, that the, the manifolds or the surfaces that could be extended equivalently um, are precisely the, the ones that are toral in some sense. Uh, in what sense? So first, let's, let's just notice that the uh, Bordism group of surfaces is, is isomorphic to the homology of the classifying space. At this level, they're isomorphic. And in the homology, we might take the homology classes, which are generated by maps of tori. Simply, simply think that you choose some holonomy around one, one group, one circle, and some holonomy around the other. These are tori manifolds on which one group like, like here and the other one like that. And what Eric showed is that the, the, the elements in homology or the surfaces that live here, uh, which are linear combination of those uh, toral manifolds, are the ones that one can somehow extend. And it was it is a very nice if and only if statement. Namely, if it's not tall, it's not going to be possible to be extended. And so what it turns out is that the co-kernel is a subgroup of the homology group, which we Eric told or it was known before, is it's called Bogomolo multiplier of the group in the homology version, uh, because there is a cohomology version due to Bogomolo himself, uh, which is precisely defined as this. You may think just take the homology of the finite group 
and then take rid of the total classes of the images of the circle by the circle. And whatever is left are the ones that are not possible to be extended. Um, so this very nice theorem of Eric was the one that when I saw it, I saw, well, this is, this is the piece, this is the piece that we needed. This is the piece that I was looking for uh, to understand the equivalent borderism groups, because precisely how it's studied is exactly this question. Take a manifold with a specific action. Does it extend or not? This, this is the exact question that was behind the, the previous calculations. Um, I know what happened with my computer. Oh, no, yes. So the idea of Eric is, is very nice, is the following. Let's suppose, let's suppose your surface extends to a three-dimensional manifold. Um, the three-dimensional manifold has now any action. So you may take um, what uh, Eric called, which I suppose that's the name, the singular loss I, namely take the points um, fixed by any subgroup of the group G, beside. So just simply take all the possible fixed point data, besides, of course, uh, the identity here. And, and since the action is free on the boundary, uh, you see, you look carefully what it is, this is just a one dimensional gadget. Uh, that's what it is. Um, so the, the case Eric did, uh, because there is a complication when the group has a spherical subgroups or has platonic subgroups, because uh, then it's only, oh, look, look, Eric is showing some, Eric is showing already the platonic uh, <laughs> solids. <laughs> if you see the camera, Eric is showing the platonic solids. So the platonic solids were the one doing the complications here. And so Eric, the, the first approach of Eric, was, let's get rid of the platonic groups. Let's just focus on groups which without platonic subgroups. Uh, one easy case is an odd dimensional or, or, or uh, a group of dimension of, of so rank odd or size odd, uh, because all the spherical subgroups are of even dimension. And uh, the idea is that you take this fixed point data, and then if you don't have these spherical subgroups, then this, this fixed point loss i is a disjoint union of circles. And that's the key point. It's a disjoint union of circles. They might be embedded into one another. And since it's a disjoint union of circles, then one could see that the tori somehow are there because around each circle, one could somehow uh, expand it and make the torus that one is thinking about. Uh, so in, in, in one side is fixed point and in the other has to be free. So this, the, the, that was the idea. W with that in mind, then, then it's easy to show that if the group um, has no spherical subgroups, and the only thing that one cannot feel um, are precisely the groups which are, or the classes, the surfaces, which are cannot be split into some sort of tori. And um, we managed to generalize this uh, result to any finite group. We needed to do some extra, extra work to deal with the, with the platonic subgroups. Um, and so we were able to see, okay, let's see what happens with the bordism group, the equivalent bordism group, not only of free actions, but the whole thing. And so since we know what is the free part, in some sense, the question is, what is the torsion part? And since we had this study of surfaces, we went to the bordism group of surfaces and we wanted to know what is the torsion part. And it turns out there is a lot of torsion and the torsion depends on the Bogomolov multiply or the Bogomolov groups of the um, vile groups of the subgroups, namely you take the sum over all conjugacy classes of subgroups and construct the vile group. Take a normalizer, divide the group, and you just simply need to add overall Bogomolovs. Why? Because these are the ones that you cannot uh, uh, somehow fill. Why this somehow uh, is a counterexample for the conjecture? Because these are torsion classes. Not because they are of odd degree, no, these are of even degree, but are torsion. And because they are torsion, then the equivalent Bordism group is not free. So there is these torsion classes um, mo moving around. Um, of course, there are gazillion questions whether one could ask what happens in four dimensions or in three dimensions or in six dimensions or in five dimensions. We don't know. We don't know. So now this is just the door that we open to, to understand what happens in the other dimensions. And in, and in this, in the, the nice thing is in this dimension is, is simple to understand. Well, of course, you, you need a PhD in mathematics and all those things, but, but it's easy to... <laughs> it's just when, when we say this to the students, they get upset. 
So, <laughs> uh, well, to us, it's easy to understand what, what, what we did. It's very geometrical, the construction of Eric is very, very geometrical, very constructive, um, uh, it's very nice. And so one believes that this thing could be uh, put into higher dimensions. Just to show you what types of groups are we talking about on which the Mogomolo multiplier is not trivial. This was started by algebraic geometers because um, one easy way to construct some sort of algebraic varieties is simply taking a representation of a finite group and taking the associated uh, variety uh, of taking the, you take the associated ring and take the gene invariant part. And that's a very nice algebraic variety, studied heavily by the algebraic geometers. And uh, the question that raised was, when is this um, a manifold or algebraic variety projective? And it turns out that Bogomolov was the one that noticed that um, if you calculate the Brouwer group of these varieties, the Brouwer group is the Bogomolov multiplier of the group. The only thing you need to know is that the representation is faithful. That's the only thing you need to have. And therefore, he constructed, of course, infinitely many examples of uh, non-projective algebraic varieties, just simply by knowing representations of the group. So which group uh, um, has non-trivial Bogomolov multiplier? The smallest is of size 64. Of course, these are all big groups. Um, um, and because of the biggest size in some sense, or because of the structure, is not, it was not noticed by these calculations of Carlos. Uh, and is this, this one is one of the ones, there are many others. There are three of the same as a isoclinic class, but you could take this one, the quaternions acting on the cyclic group of order eight in this very simple fashion. Uh, and one can show, once you know, then it's easy to show, that the Bogomolov multiplier is isomorphic to the homology, and the homology is Z2, and is the Bogomolov multiplier. And the way to obtain this uh, element as a surface uh, can be easily carried out taking the, the fundamental group of a surface of genus 2 and doing this specific clear map to the generators of the group. And then one has the explicit generator as a surface of genus 2, and not and can and which cannot be uh, written as a sum of toros. That's the reason that is uh, living in the Bogomolo multiplier. And of course, there are infinitely more of these groups. Um, so to finish, because time is up, um, the conjecture is false in general, which is not bad. This is good because then one can study when is true. What are the conditions on the groups? so that the conjecture is true. Of course, we know that if it's a billion, if it's a semi-direct product of a billion, uh, but there are some cases in which is false, as we just saw for these uh, P groups of non-trivial Bogomolov multiplier. And, and so the, the easier question is, when free actions equivalently bound? We don't know. And, 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 and the nice thing about this question is this, this is the classical question, the classical question of Poincaré or Betty in the 1800s. When does a manifold bound, uh, which was answered by Tom and von Tragen and many others. But if we put now the equivariant part on it, then uh, it turns out to be, well, that one needs to do something about it because it's not so obvious. And, uh, and perhaps Peter could say something, what was the idea some years ago? Now, one might think that the conjecture is true for the homotopy Bordism groups, uh, because one could think, ha, if you stabilize, the problem fades away. No, it's a, it's a stable problem, in which if you stabilize, then it fades away. Uh, the answer is no. And uh, Sophie Chris, who is, uh, I could have said, a, a, a marvelous, uh, how do you call it? Yeah. We would call it in Spanish, Niño, una Niña Maravilla, a marvelous uh, kid and very intelligent. She's doing her undergraduate in Michigan still, and she already proved that the evenness conjecture is false in the homotopy setup because she very smartly uh, took a counterexample that had constructed Igor Kris in the 90s of a conjecture of Hopkins-Kuhn-Ravenel 
on which the conjecture was that the Morava K theory of the classifying spaces of finite groups is concentrated in even degrees. And Igor Kris constructed a P group of size P to the P to the six, similar to the group that I had there, but not exactly that one. And he very smartly calculated a torsion element uh, that appear in odd dimensions in some Morava K theory group. So what Sophie did was she took this construction of Igor of the 90s that was in Morava K theory and brought it from the Brown Peterson spectrum to the Bordism spectrum. And because of that class being of uh, of torsion type, there in the Morava K theory implied that there was some torsion class in the homotopy equivariant unitary Bordism groups. But this is the this is the subject of the next talk, which Sophie will talk about. Um, and uh, what is very nice that she has a proof that is completely different, similar in some sense. It's, 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 it, the, the tools are different. Our tools are very geometrical. Her tools are very algebraic. But we still don't know what is the relation between her counterexample and our counterexample, and how does these two theories fit. And we don't even know what is going on in some sense. We don't even know what's going on. So that's what I wanted to say. And thank you very much for having me in this seminar. Thank you very much, Bernardo. Very nice talk. Well, thank you, Carlos. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice to, to hear all the story again. Yeah, recall some moments. Yeah. Uh, so it's time for questions. Just do it. Yeah, turn on the microphone and do it. So your deficiency with the homotopy versus the geometric version, is that the lack of equivariant transversality? Yeah, Professor Dorman, you're completely right. That's, that's, the same, that's, the same, that's the main problem all all way long, the lack of transversality in the equivariant setup. Um, and somehow, because of that, things are, yeah, you cannot move things around sometimes. You're stuck with fixed point data. You, 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 you know that you cannot separate things which are stuck at fixed point data. I mean, while in the homotopy separate setup, you just move them around. Uh, but you're right. This is the main. This is well. I don't know if this is the main. I would, well, no, I would say this is the main problem. Yes. Uh, that's why it's not so clear how to. What is the relation between the two uh, constructions? Um, it's not clear. For example, it's not clear whether this. Surfaces that we, well, we, the surfaces that cannot be uh, extended, if you stabilize them, whether they will bound stably or not. Because exactly depends on the calculation of the bordism groups of this classifying space, which I don't know what they are. <laughs> so somehow I don't even know if, if they survive stably or not. Um, we don't know much, I would say. Although there is a lot of machinery, uh, somehow you, you might correct me, Professor Landberg. Now we have more machinery than before, but we don't really know these examples. <laughs> somehow, <laughs> well, examples. Another question. I, I want to mention. Uh, I would like to know what what are your 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 thoughts about first. Uh, well, we have proved that it's not free the, the unitary evidence conjecture, and Sophie Chris proved that it's not true, but the evidence part for the homotopical conjecture. So, what we we would expect for the evidence part of the unitary conjecture? Uh, uh, so there are two things as you mentioned. So there is the there is that is free, and the, there is that is concentrated in even dimensions. You're right. So the, we have well, we, we notice that there are distortion classes. So it's not free, but it's the, nevertheless there is still in even dimensions. So Carlos asking, what what do you think happens in odd dimensions? 
I am pretty certain that the torsion classes will appear all over the place. Why? Because I've been trying to see how can I extend this to three dimensions, four dimensions, and it's a very non-trivial calculation on Bordism groups of classifying spaces of finite groups. And, and finite groups are amazing at what you can do with them in the sense of, of the, the Serra spectral sequence. You, you can make, you, you can construct groups that do many things that you want to do in the, in the sense of construction torsion element. This is the trick of Igor, by Chris, trick, the idea, it's not a trick. And, and it's with the same somehow what we do. It's just we haven't put it that way, but it's again some sort of spectral sequence. We construct some groups with some condition, and then we see that the boundary map is not surjective. Uh, mm -hmm. So I believe that there will be, uh, depending on the group torsion classes all over the place. Okay. And just by uh, one comment uh, uh, about the free extension conjecture, that is uh, this question that when a free action bounds for a surface. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, or here, exactly. Yeah. When, when you manage this uh, counter examples of Eric that appear the, the um, spherical group, you make these procedures of blow, blow up. So uh, how, could you say a little bit about that? Uh, that's okay, me. so so what 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 Carlos is asking is something that I you know I don't know if Professor Edmonds is still there, but uh, if he is 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 what Carlos is asking is imagine you have an action on a surface that is free of a group, and then is extended, and so internally you might have a point which is fixed by some platonic group, let's say A four, it's fixed by the so there is a point fixed by A four, and of course from this point there are some Paths coming out, which are points fixed by cyclic subgroups. No? Uh, this is what I was asking Professor Edmond last time because he was only looking at complete fixed points or or nothing. Uh, and Carlos is asking, so what was the idea there? Um, and so whenever there are these fixed points of of a dihedral group, I recalled some construction of algebraic geometers, which somehow I recall when I was a postdoc in Michigan many many years ago that they had a, a, a seminar and every seminar they did the same. They start, let's take this algebraic variety and let's take a blow up. Every time, a blow up. Just, and, I, and I was always thinking, why a blow up? Why, why they blow everything up? Um, and it took me some time to understand. But of course, if you do the blow up in this point, namely think of it geometrically, you will not only care about the point, but also about the direction on which you arrive to the point. You, like Nash, you just, you just think of the point and the way you arrive to the point. And if you do that, the point becomes all the possible directions on which you arrive to the point. And since you had some paths coming into it, to the same point, but in the blow up, these paths are not going to intersect because they have different velocities. So in the blow up, this, you have a little uh, point with four legs of the alternating group, you blow it up, and now it turns out that these four legs, they don't join together because now the, the, the velocities are different points in the blow up. And so what you had as a point with four legs becomes some sort of four, circle, four circles that do not intersect anymore. But the blow up procedure only happens around the point. So to change the boardism class of the interior, but the boundary is still the same. So you change your manifold by a, another one, which is not living in the same boardism class, but the new manifold, has a blow up, but the, bound, the complete boundary never changed because you just blew a point. So the whole boundary stays. And by doing that, you kill all those isotropies that you disliked in the blow up. The price to pay, you change the bordism class. But that's a good price. For the question, it's a good price to pay because by doing this blow up, now you end up with circles. And these circles, you know how to treat them. So, but the price to pay is that you have to add. But of course, what is telling me here, what is what is completely saying to you or to me, is that these are generators of bordism groups, of relative bordism groups of three dimensions. Because if I change a point by something else, by changing the bordism class, and the other one contracted, meant to me, uh, these 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 platonic groups are generating bordism classes in the three dimensional bordism group. 
and, and I suppose this will happen in eight dimension. Take any, any faithful representation on the reals, take a fixed point, take the blow up, and then you see that you change the Bordison class, that you somehow untangle all possible paths, but this will be some sort of generator. And that was uh, some sort of the question, Professor Edmonds, that we were thinking that uh, just think just the alternating group on four, uh, four letters. You might have a fixed point of the whole group and some little paths coming out a little bit, no? like in the tetrahedron. And, and the, the, the quotient of the diagram is some sort of a point and legs coming out. Uh, and the question was regarding what you said, what, what could we say about this one dimensional diagram? when one think only the alternating group or, or the, the platonic groups, which are the ones that matters in three-dimensional world. We don't know. That was, that's why I asked you this last time, Professor Edmonds. So, so uh, I, think, uh, so Carlos, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, okay. So um, it's good to say maybe that uh, so Eric, uh, the example was because it was in dimension odd. So, but with this professor of, of, of blowing up, so we have that the, the Bogomolov multiply is a complete, a complete obstruction for... Exactly. Uh, so yeah. Carlos is saying it right. So with this blow up construction, the, the, the result of Eric was generalized to any finite group and is the Bogomolov. The relation of this Bogomolov to the geometrical theorem to this you know, algebraic geometry is still puzzling to us. It's very puzzling. Uh, why the same invariant appears in two different places um, is to me very puzzling. I, I still don't really know what's going on. Mm. Okay. Well, nice. um, is there Carlos, and Jose, and Alan, and Peter, and Laura, Carl, yeah. thank you very much for listening. Beautiful talk, Bernard. Oh, Peter, you're always so <laughs> kind. <laughs> <laughs> What <laughs> one matter of ancient history? I think Pontryagin was uh, trying to study stable homotopy groups of spheres, uh, not just near the beginning, uh, in a geometrical way. So uh, he he developed uh, some geometrical methods uh, to to help him understand homotopy groups of spheres and. Then, uh, then Tom recognized that he could do a lot more with that construction. So uh, Pontryagin had it first in a limited case. Then uh, Tom took it to unoriented and oriented Bordism. Uh, Milner and also Novikov uh, for unitary Bordism. Of course, Terry Wall also clarifying unoriented uh, oriented Bordism mm -hmm. during that period. So there's a handful of people. Uh, no, the question that I was uh, that I could address to you is the map is called the Tom Pontryagin map. Well, Tom is Tom sort of saw the full the full power of that approach. Uh, uh, Pontry building on Pontryagin's initial uh, uh, initial study that was really just trying to get a geometric approach to deal with stable homotopic groups of spheres. In fact, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. But somehow, if we, if we take frame manifold, which is what Pontryagin yeah, was manifold. doing, yes. he, he, he was the one noticing these stable homotopy groups of the frame manifolds, namely the homotopy groups of spheres. Right, right, frame manifolds. Yeah, exactly. So, but he, so, which already, uh, but the idea, the important idea that Tom built on was already present. Ah. Pontryagin's work in a limited case. Ah. Ah, uh, that's why it's called Tom Pontryagin map. So it's somehow yeah. was already there. Well, you uh, get your choice. Uh, Pontryagin comes first alphabetically, but Tom really uh, exploited, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> exploited the. Oh, uh, uh, should I, I should you're right? I should change the. Did you right? It's, it's, it's completely yeah. wrong in all possible ways. Alphabetically, oh, time wise. <laughs> time in one way and half the time the other. No, Pontryagin Tom. I'm going Pontryagin. to say from now on. You're right. <laughs> This also occurs in work, in discussion about the work on the Carver invariant, for example. Oh. <laughs> uh, in some of the expository accounts about Carver invariant, you'll probably find uh, mm -hmm. uh, going back in history, uh, including Pontryagin. Okay. Okay. Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I should be more careful with my 
<laughs> <Not worried. laughs> okay. But, uh, Professor Langer, just last thing. You were the one translating from Russian to English. How do you spell Pontragin? How do I? Sorry? It's, since you were you were at some point translating Russian articles into English at yes, some point. But... How did you translate Pontragin? Uh, I was not yet doing <laughs> that came before me. Oh, <laughs> uh, sadly, sadly, I didn't. I did not think to translate Novikov's 1960 paper, uh, which was not yet available, readily available uh, at that in 1960 into English. But then I got very enthusiastic. In fact, met Novikov in 19, uh, I guess 1967, and uh, he had. Then at that point, de developed much more the the uh, sort of Adams and Novikov spectral sequence and other things came out of his work in the 1967 era. Big big paper, so that was worth translating. At least his De Quadi announcement uh, is what I translated, and it was short. It was good. Yeah, for like all these announcements. <laughs> <laughs> Carlos, then thank you very much. Okay. But, but don't yeah. forget to announce, Carlos, that next. Yeah. it's a different yeah. time yeah, yeah. This, uh, in, in two weeks uh, it's two two hours later so yeah, yeah. two hours later yes, so just two hours later yeah. uh, hours it later. because sophie time. couldn't make it because she she has class <laughs> yeah she has class so this, uh, <laughs> but i encourage all the people to to attend to this class to this uh, talk uh, it's just a continuation and okay thank you very much Bernardo. carlos thank you very much Thank you.